uh, fearless faith. And it's a message of hope, really, um, just in this day and age, in this world when so much is going on and there is so much doubt and there is so much disbelief. Uh, there's so much confusion about who God is and what his purpose and desire is for our lives. Uh, I think it's import an important thing to fall back to the hope uh, that we have with the Lord. Uh, let's go ahead and let's just read verses 22 through 24. We'll start there. It says, immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Well, he sent the disciples away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Let's pray. Father, we just uh, lift up this morning to you, Lord. And I am excited, Lord. We are excited, God, to get into your word, Father, as we just had a beautiful time of worship, God, exalting you, Lord, lifting your name on high, God, giving you the glory and honor that is just due your name, Father. And as we just uh, really are continuing on from yesterday, as we had just an awesome time of worship in the, uh, the worship, the night of worship and the worship conference throughout the day, and uh, just such an amazing time and amazing work that you did, uh, even in my own life, Lord, and, and with many here in the body, Lord. We pray, Father, that you would continue just to join us here this morning, open your word up to us, allow it to be real and true in our lives, Father. We lift up Calvary Chapel Banning to you and Pastor Ryan and uh, my dad as he's out there as well sharing the word, Father. We ask, Lord, that you would minister to these guys and to this congregation, Father, that you would meet their needs, Lord, that you would um, just speak through your, uh, through your word, Father, through your spirit, Lord Jesus, that it would just fall afresh on them, that they would be encouraged and just re-energized this morning, Father. We thank you, God, for what you want to do this morning in our lives, uh, for the hope that we truly do have in you, Father. And uh, though this world is dark, though it's gloomy, Lord God, though uh, if we look at this world, it's so easy to get discouraged, we know, God, that if we keep our eyes upon you, that there's always hope, Father, that is found in you, Lord. So we just lift this morning up to you, God, as we get into your word. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Fearless faith, again, is the title of my message, and uh, Matthew chapter 14, verse 27, that we'll be reading over here shortly, it says, but immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid, is verse 27, and as Jesus hears earlier in the chapter about John the Baptist's head being served on a platter uh, to Herod's niece, he leaves the area, it says, to be alone and to mourn the death of his cousin, John. And uh, Jesus, it says, being moved with compassion, meets a multitude of people. Uh, and you remember the story, he feeds them with five loaves and two fish. And uh, this now brings us to verse 22. So just to set up uh, kind of the, uh, you know, the chapter here for you guys. And in verse 22, let's read it again. It says, immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before or go before him to the other side while he sat, sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And we'll stop there. My first point for this morning's message, if you are taking notes, I always encourage uh, you to take notes and to write things down. It helps me personally when I hear messages and sermons to just note little things down that the Lord speaks to me and, and pull things out to remember for a later date. But my first point this morning is uh, troubled waters with no warning. Troubled waters with no warning. So as Jesus goes up to pray, he sends his disciples ahead of him on a boat in the Sea of Galilee there. And the Gospel of John tells us that it was to a city called Capernaum, to that little city uh, called Capernaum. And I think it's safe to say that as the disciples were put into this boat by Jesus, that they had a mindset, they had a belief and a thought that Jesus was going to meet them on the other side when they arrive. They thought, we'll get into this boat, we'll listen to our rabbi here, and he's going to meet us on the other side. And they probably thought, 
Uh, we've been on this sea before plenty of times. We know the weather. We know the, uh, you know the area so well. Nothing to worry about. And as they are on this boat in the middle of the sea, it says that the winds began to blow and the waves began to rise. And if you've ever been on a boat in the middle of the sea, you know that as the winds begin to blow and the waves be, or the winds begin to blow and the waves begin to rise, that the fun begins to end, right? Pretty much. And the closest that I can uh, come to relating to this story in my life would be on uh, my wife and, and, and on, on uh, my uh, second year anniversary. We decided, we had the great idea of taking a cruise, right? We thought, wow, we always hear great things about cruises, the all-you-can-eat buffets, you know, the room service that never ends 24 hours a day. I don't know how many times she ordered that chocolate cake to get sent to the room, you know. We'd go to the buffet, have the pizza, and run back to the room just to order the chocolate cake. And we thought this is going to be great, right? Uh, A cruise, the first one for her, first one for myself as well. And as we're on this great big ship, I know it's not much of a comparison, little boat and a great big cruise ship. I'll try to make it anyways, though. Uh, the, uh, as we're out there in the middle, in the middle of the ocean, uh, there's a hurricane in front of us that we're chasing, and there's a hurricane behind us that is chasing us, right? So if you can imagine on the coast of Mexico going down, two hurricanes, and we're stuck right in the middle. And at night, every single night of the cruise, as the sun would go down, the wind would begin to blow, and the waves would begin to rise. And uh, so much so that at night, I would sit up, and I would look out the porthole window, and I would see the water just start to come up over the window, and then I'd see it go back down. Under the, and I'd see it come back up. And, and mind you, you know, we were like, I don't know, gosh, four or five stories high, it felt like, when you're on the outside of the boat looking up. You know, we were really high up there. And even at night, you could hear the waves just crashing on the side of the boat, just boom, boom. And I thought people were like slamming doors and fights were going. I'm like, what is going on here? And realizing when I looked outside, there's a storm that is going on, you know, out there. And as I'm sitting there in bed, you know, praying, uh, I look over at my wife and she's just sound asleep, you know, in bed. Just no worries. She has so much faith, you know, in the Lord. I was ready. I had my shoes right there ready to go, you know. But we, we had certain expectations for this trip. We had certain thoughts that, that, you know, this was going to be a calm, peaceful cruise, a time to relax. We expected uh, to be at certain places at certain times, to see certain things in these places. But what we didn't expect is what actually happened. That uncomfortable, that tiring, even sickening at times feeling. And sometimes in life, the unexpected happens, right? We think that things are going to run smoothly. We have certain expectations. As the disciples were set on a path, by Jesus. Remember, it says that he put them in the boat. They thought they were going to be safe. They thought they were going to see Jesus on the other side, that he'd just be waiting for them and all would be good. And unfortunately, what happened to them was the unexpected, that uncomfortable, that sickening, even that deadly storm that they found themselves in the middle of. Uh, You ever find yourself in the middle of a storm? It can be fun, right? Kind of cool at first, like you're inside a house. Here in California, you know, we don't get too crazy of weather, you know, so we have little storms that go on, and we love it, right? We love it when it rains. We feel like it's pouring like crazy, and it's really just a little sprinkle compared to the rest of the world. But, you know, take yourself out of the shelter. Take yourself out of the protection of the building and put yourself in the middle of the downpour, and all of a sudden it becomes real, right? You get stuck in your car maybe on the freeway when it starts pouring and the water starts to, you know, rise up and you see the cars as they come by splashing everyone. It all of a sudden becomes uncomfortable and even dangerous. You know, I truly believe that the Lord has set you, has set us on a certain path this day. He has a specific destination for us. He has a a specific plan for our lives. Psalms 119 says that his word is a a lamp unto our path and a light unto our feet. His word guides us 
through this life. And, and even on this life, even uh, uh, within this life, we have certain expectations. You know, some of us have been on this path since we were children. Some of us have grown up in the church. Some of us have known the word of God from, uh, from a young child. Some of us are just coming to the realization of the Lord and who he truly is and his true desires for us. Proverbs 16, 9 says, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. God de- uh, desire, God's desire, no matter what your personal background is, is to specifically put you on a path that is led and directed and guided by him and by his word, where he is in control, where he decides which is best and, and which is not. And at times on this journey where we think it's supposed to be easy, right? When you first come to know the Lord, oh, all my worries are gone. All my problems and issues are gone. We think it's supposed to be fun. We have those certain expectations. It's that we find ourselves with doubt at times. We find ourselves in the middle of the storm and we even find ourselves at times with disbelief, questioning the Lord. Lord, was this the right decision? Should I be at this church? Should I be in this family? Not that you have a choice with that, but in this job. We start to disbelieve the promises that God has given us. In the book of Mark, it tells us about a man who had a child uh, that had some issues. And in verse 17 of chapter 19, it says this. It says, then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. They could not. Underline that. They could not. This man, I'm sure when his son was born, he looked at his baby with all the hope of a father, right? With all the thoughts of success for his son, this child is going to be different. This child is going to do something awesome, thinking about who he's going to grow up to be and what his personality is going to be like and who he's going to affect, the career that he would have. But very quickly, this man's dreams would be crushed. His child would be unsuccessful and even suicidal. And in the midst of the storm, it's very easy to lose hope, right? It's in the midst uh, of the trials and the tribulation when things are going wrong, when problems are just rising all around us, that we end up losing that hope. It just begins to totally fade away. You know, to me, that's what happens with so many of our youth. So many of these school shootings that are happening, uh, you know, out at these campuses that now it seems like we hear about every week almost, right? Every other week, another shooting at a university. And all the talk that goes on from from those in government, you know, about, well, we just need to create more laws and we need to do this different and, you know, yada, yada, whatever. But where's the talk of the hope within these kids' lives? Where's the talk of the purpose within their families? The desire for a successful life and a successful family to be married one day and have children and just the hope uh, that God would have for them. I don't hear it. I don't see it. We should be the ones proclaiming it as the church. What does the word say? If we're not going to proclaim it, who? Who will, right? Why are those created in the image of God, those that were created for good, those that have been created for a purpose with a plan Losing all hope. Ephesians 2.10 tells us, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Why are we his art piece? It says that we are, we are his workmanship. We were created by Christ Jesus for good works. Imagine that. The time and effort that a carpenter spends on a, on a piece of, you know, furniture. A craftsman that he spends, I just think of uh, my grandfather, uh, both of my grandfathers, they were craftsmen. You know, they would spend time building benches and building pieces of furniture. And even my great-grandfather, I think uh, the stories are that he was in like his 80s even, 
he lived to his 90s, but he was in his 80s, I believe, and he was still outside building that white picket fence for my grandma, his daughter, you know, for her house. But the time and the detail that goes into their work and how much love, that is the same love and detail and time that God has put into you, that God has put into your life. He's created you, his workmanship for good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Why are we living in doubt? Why do we at times live in fear or hold back and not grab a hold of what God has prepared for us? Think about that. God has prepared success for you. God has prepared ministry for you and not necessarily church organized ministry. You have to be a part of the children's ministry. You have to be a part of the women's ministry. You just have to be a part of ministry. You know, that word ministry just means to attend to the needs of others. And as believers, as Christians, God has called us to ministry. God has called us to attend to the needs of others. And we learned at our men's retreat that the reason and the, the, you know, the reason that we're able to do that is because our needs have been attended to or tended to. Our needs have been met as believers. Jesus has attended to our needs. And in return, we can now tend to others. You know, I think one reason is because one generation, it seems, always fails the next generation. You know, I know my generation, I feel, has failed the next generation. You know, in growing up, you have so much hope, right, for your generation. We're the generation that has the answers. We're the generation that, that is going to change the world. We're going to bring the change and bring the hope. You know, we're going to erase racism. It's going to be gone with our generation. We all get along. And then what happens, the older we get, the more we become to change and to be like the world rather than changing the world to be like us or to be like the Lord. We fail the next. We have been faithless. We've been full of fear within our faith. And, and I think the older we get, we, we tend to lose even more and more of that hope in the Lord, making us so powerless that even when a father would bring his son, his suicidal son, his possessed son, to disciples that are followers of Jesus Christ, that the only answer that he would get is, but they could not. They could not. They couldn't bring the answer. They couldn't bring the healing. They wouldn't have the answer for him. Jesus responds to him in Mark 9, 19. He says, oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? And as the winds blow and the waves rise and the problems get bigger and this world becomes more uncertain, we don't need to be fearful, but we need to be fearless in our faith. Our faith needs to go stronger in those times. The fear needs to diminish and go away. And usually it's in those times that the Lord truly begins to work, right? He truly begins to do something awesome, something really neat within our lives and within our families. Matthew 14, let's read verse 25 through 27. It says, now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I, do not be afraid. My second point this morning is difficult to believe, difficult to believe. Jesus coming down from praying on the mountain, it says that he steps out onto the water. He steps out onto the water. Think about that. Foot by foot, in the midst of a storm, Jesus walks onto the sea. I don't know about you guys, but that is some of the most hard to believe stuff I've ever heard, right? Right? Sometimes we just take it as Christians, right? Oh, yeah, it just says it, so whatever, let's move on, you know. To the, but think about it. Did Jesus walk on water? Do we believe that Jesus stepped out foot by foot onto the sea? For the disciples, it was hard for them to believe. What does it say as they, as they saw him? It says that they cried out in fear. It is a ghost. You would think, man, with all their faith, right away they should have known it was Jesus. 
They cried out, you know, this is some scary stuff. Ghosts are nothing to joke around about, right? It's scary. You know, when I was a kid, I used to, I used to always imagine a ghost in my room in the corner. And I'd always, I was so afraid, you know, as a kid. And my brother would hate me because we shared a room. And I was like, something's there. I know something's there, you know. And I'd like kick the bottom bed or whatever. And I'd wake up and it would be a hanger, you know, with, the, with the, our jacket, you know, on it. Oh, okay. And I never moved it. I don't know why I never got rid of that stupid thing. But, you know, but I love this portion of scripture because it tells me that it's okay for grown men to cry out in fear. You know, it's a ghost. They, they cried out staring death in the face there. But it's in the middle of the storm when all around us that things are going terribly wrong, that it's then that it's the most difficult to believe in Jesus, right? It's the most difficult to have faith in the Lord. It's when I feel all alone. It's when I feel like nobody is there for me. Like I have nobody that I can turn to. It's hard to believe Jesus when he said in Matthew 15, 15, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. It's in those times when I'm all alone that it's hard to believe that Jesus wants to be my friend. He wants to be my companion. He wants to be there for me. It's hard to believe when my family can't afford to pay the bills, when we're struggling to make ends meet and we can't afford even the necessities. It's hard to believe Philippians 4.19 that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory by Jesus Christ. It's hard to believe that that bill will be paid for and that food will be on the table ready for us when we need it. It's when the world is telling us that God doesn't even exist, that there is no God, there is no creator, everything just happened by chance and by accident that it's hard to believe Genesis 1-1, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, that God created the unbeliever even. God created the atheist. God doesn't believe in atheists, right? His creation even cries out of his existence. Let's read verse 27 through 29 in Matthew. It says, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, it says, and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. My third point is do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. What faith this man Peter had, right? One minute, he's full of fear. One minute, he's crying out that it's a ghost. One minute, he's in the middle of the storm. And the next minute, we see his faith in the Lord. We see comfort in the Lord. We see his faith solidified and just hardened and strengthened. It's so amazing to me that Peter actually believes the words of Jesus, not that he just heard them, not that he just kind of, you know, was there. He believed the words of Jesus. He took them, you know, for what they were. The words of Christ are our greatest comfort. They're our greatest teacher. They're our greatest comfort in time of need. As the disciples are crying out in fear, Jesus responds to them. Listen, in these words, in the New King James, as we just read, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. In the New Living Translation, it says, do not be afraid, he said. Take courage. I am here. In the ESV translation, it says, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. And I love this one translation that says, cheer up. I am. Just cheer up. I am. Don't be afraid. All different translations with different encouragements. One says, be of good cheer. One says, take courage. One says, take heart. One says, cheer up. But the thing that stays the same throughout all of them is do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Cast out all fear. Have you ever been afraid of anything? You ever been afraid? To be honest with you, the last thing that I can think of, you know, 
real fear. I'm not talking a spider, you know, in the bed or something like that, and you get up screaming and yelling. The real fear with me was the day our son was born, right? And my wife laying on the delivery bed. And, you know, I don't know about you ladies, but for us men, it scares the heck out of us seeing you, you know, like that. And, you know, with our delivery, it was, uh, it was a difficult one. The doctors had a very hard time um, getting Luke to come out. He did not want to come out. He was like, he was in there. He was happy. He would have stayed in there a while longer probably if we let him. And he did not want to come out. And the doctors had the, you know, the jaws of life, they call it, right? Is that what they got? And, they had, and they're pulling on him. And they're pulling on him. And I'm watching the doctor and I'm watching the nurse. And I'm watching the nurse give these, give these uh, looks even to the doctor. And at one moment she said, doctor, doctor, be careful. And at that time, it's just like, whew, all I could do is just start praying, right? Like, man, Lord, please let him be okay. Please let everything be okay, Lord. You know, and my wife's sitting there. She's just, I don't know, she didn't know what was going on. I don't know why they only give the women the epidural. It's like, it's not fair. <laughs> she was just like, she was just enjoying the whole, you know, childbirth thing, I think. But it's in those times that we have to have faith in the Lord's words. And we have to fall back on the hope that we have in Jesus that we have to allow that fear to press us and to push us closer to the Lord. Verse 28 says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, Peter said, Lord, if it is really you, God, if this is real, if what I am seeing is real, Lord, he said, command me to come to you on the water. Peter said, prove it, Lord. Prove that it's you. Prove that you're real. Prove that you are God. Prove that you can do what you say you can do and let me join you where you are. Let me see your majesty. Let me see your glory. Let me see you in action, Peter said. He didn't just say, command me. Or he didn't just, he didn't just. The Greek word, let me start there. The Greek word for command is kaluo. So he didn't just say, command me. But he said, order me. Peter was basically waiting to be ordered by the Lord. Peter's in the boat. The storm is going on. The waves are crashing. The wind is rising. And Peter is there waiting to be ordered by the Lord. Lord, I'm not moving out of this boat until you tell me to. Until you order me to. Psalms 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know. Wait upon the Lord. Wait to move. Wait for your next command by the Lord. Seek his leading and his direction in your life. Don't just jump out of the boat. You'll sink, right? Don't just jump out. But wait for the Lord to command you to come out onto the boat. So he said, come. And when Peter had come out of the boat, it says, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Amazing. My next point, verse four, is no, uh, or point four, is no impossibilities. No impossibilities. It's, it's when we believe that awesome things begin to happen, right? All the impossibles begin to all of a sudden become possible. It's when we wait upon the Lord and we say, Lord, command me that the Lord will bless whatever he commands us to do. God is not just going to command us to do the impossible and then just leave us there hopeless and helpless. He didn't just put his disciples into the boat, push them out into the sea, and then let them be where they were and leave them, you know, for their own demise. No, he met them exactly where they were. He met them exactly where they needed him to be. And that's what we need to do. We need to wait upon the Lord to command us with the belief and the hope that he will bless whatever it is that he is commanding us to do. Lord, command me to go to that specific school or college. Bring it to the Lord in prayer. Lord, where do you want me to go after high school, after college? Where do you want me, Lord? Command me to find the right job, Lord. Command me, Lord God, to find the the right people to talk to and the right friends to have and the right people to associate with God. Command me 
to speak only encouraging words, Lord, to one another. Command me, Lord, to listen and to watch only things that are edifying within my life, to seek after that career, Lord God, that would allow me to serve you still, to have a, a life that is still centered upon you. Command me, Lord, to believe without fear, without doubt. What do you think the other disciples were thinking about Peter? You know, when Peter stood up, <coughs> crying out to the Lord. You know, they, at first they were probably thinking, Peter, sit down, Peter. You're crazy, Peter. Be quiet, Peter. You're rocking the boat even more, Peter. But what do you think they thought when Peter got out of the boat and they saw him begin to walk on water? You go, Peter. Take us with you, Peter. Don't leave us here in the boat, Peter. I'm sure their attitude began to change. They were probably just staring in awe at what Peter was accomplishing. Matthew 16, 15. Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? And they said, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say that you're Elijah. And others say that you are Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus asked them again, he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up and answered. He said, you are the son or you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter knew exactly who Jesus was. And when you walk through impossibilities with Jesus, there's no doubting who he truly is. Peter had walked on water. Don't try to tell Peter that Jesus doesn't exist or that God isn't real and that Jesus can't do all of the impossibles and, and, and that, that you know, he's not there with the hope and the salvation that he claims to bring. Peter believed it. He knew it and he lived it. Mark 9, 23, Jesus told the father of that demon-possessed boy, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Think about that statement. Jesus told this man, all things are possible to him who believes. He tells a man with a demon-possessed, suicidal son that if you just believe, simply believe, it is possible for your son to be healed. If I was that man, I would have looked at Jesus and said, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are to give me this type of hope? To tell me when I'm looking at my son and I'm seeing all the, the you know, evilness within his life and all the hopelessness that is there, and you're telling me that all I have to do is believe? <coughs> All I have to do is just simply put my faith that you can make this thing happen and that you will do it. You know, it's so hard that when we're in the midst of the storm to believe that all things are possible, but yet it's when we are in the midst of the storm that the Lord wants us to just fall back on him and that he says, just simply believe. Just simply believe. It's so hard to believe when we look at this world, right? That all things are possible. We look at this world and we say, hey, it's not possible for our children to go to a school where they won't get tempted with drugs and alcohol and the things of this world. It's not possible to, to live day by day and not get tempted with all the sexual temptation that is out there in the media. It's not possible to not be tempted to uh, to lose my faith in you, to doubt who you truly are when all of this world and all, everything around me is trying to force me to not believe in a God that loves me and that created me for a purpose. That seems impossible. And yet you say, Jesus, that all things are possible, that we are able to overcome. They used to tell me that I could be the president of the United States, right? You guys remember that when you're kids? You can be the president of the United States, Billy. You know, and it's like we grew up thinking that was true, you know, right? Like, I can, yeah. And yet the older we get, the more things like that seem to become impossible, right? The more things like that, just the hope begins to fade, and it's, we just begin to get complacent and okay 
with our lives. Peter, in the midst of impossibilities, what does he do? He gets out of the boat and he walked on water. He said, this storm isn't going to hold me back. My fear is not going to hold me down. I'm not going to allow doubt to keep me from what God has for me. And he gets out of the boat. The choice is ours. You know, either believe the claims of Christ, either take what Christ has to say to us in his word and get out of the boat and do the impossibilities with the Lord or stay in the boat and give up all possibilities. Verse 30 there in chapter 14, read it with me. It says, but when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Lord, save me, he cries out. Point number five is put your eyes on Jesus. Peter believed, but it was when he took his eyes off of Jesus, when he started to see everything around him, the reality of things, the boisterous winds, the crazy waves that were crashing. I'm sure it was when the cold water hit his feet that he looked down and he saw where he really was and what was really going on. It was when he took his eyes off of Jesus that he began to sink, that he began to doubt. Have you ever done that? Maybe you've taken that step already. You know, maybe you got out of the boat. Maybe you took a step of faith one time. That one time, God was putting something on your heart to speak to somebody or to get involved in that one thing or ministry. You know, do this. And we took that step of faith. Maybe it was when we, we first accepted the Lord. It was, that was the biggest step of faith we took. I don't know what this is all about, and I don't understand it, but here I am, Lord. And maybe it was at that point when things began to get difficult that you looked down and you began to realize where you are. You know, a lot of times it's when we're in our schools. It's when we're in our jobs. It's when we're at our family reunions that we begin to look around and we say, is this really possible, Lord? Can you really save and work through these people? Not these people, Lord, surely not them, right? And we start to see things for what we think they are and we see the impossible, but it's at those times that we're taking our eyes off of Jesus. We're taking our eyes off of the Lord and we're allowing our surrounding, we're allowing the wind and the waves and the commotion and the chaos to lie to us, to tell us that, hey, maybe things really aren't possible. Maybe things really aren't, you know, it's not really able with the Lord. Maybe he's not as powerful. Maybe that wasn't from God. Maybe that was that burrito you ate last night, you know, and we start trying to blame everything else. We start to doubt the Lord, and at that point, it's not that God's power or his ability is missing within our lives, but it's that our disbelief begins to hold us back from what God wants to do, right? God's power is still there just as much as when we took that step. God's ability is still there just as much as when we walked out on the water, but it's our disbelief that begins to hold us back. You know, when we're praising him on Sunday. Yes, Lord, we exalt you, Lord. You are so great, God. And then we get home, and the fighting begins, and the chaos starts. Is he really as exalted in your life as we were singing that he is? You know, Peter cries out, Lord, save me. This is Peter's prayer. Lord, save me. That's it. Nothing more. Nothing less. Lord, save me. Cry out to the Lord. In those times of disbelief, in those times of chaos, and when it just seems like everything is impossible, and everything's going wrong, and there is no hope, cry out to the Lord. Lord, save me. Tell the Lord to prove himself to you. Lord, prove that it is you in my life. Lord, prove that this step of faith was because what you put in my heart, God, what you were doing within my life, Lord. Ask him to prove it. Tell him to let you join him where he is, to let you take that step of faith. Lord, save me. Lord, save me from my fears. Lord, save me from my doubt. Lord, save me from my disbelief. Save me from this world. Allow the Lord to do the impossible in your life. I'll tell you what, every 
Christian, if I can use the word great Christian, if you can say that, every Christian that did something great, D.L. Moody and Spurgeon and all these guys that we hear about, they were not great men. They didn't have great abilities. They just had great faith in a great God. It was God that did the work behind them. And a lot of times I think we sit back and we think, Lord, not me. I could never. But really, you are the exact person that God used a decade earlier, just in a dif different circumstance. It's through that faith that God wants to use us. In closing, in verse 31 through 33, let's read it. It says, And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. In the hardest times of your life, when you cry out to the Lord, Lord, save me, it's in those times that God will catch you. God will reach out his arm, he'll extend it out to you, and he'll catch you before you sink. Cry out to Jesus, and he'll answer you. And all those people around you, all those people that are watching, they're going to sit back and they're going to say, truly, this is the Son of God. Truly, they worship the true and living God. They're going to look, sit back and watch in amazement at what God has done and can do in your life. Usually, family is the hardest one to convince, right? Because they know us. They know our sins. They know our faults. And when the first months come and, and we, you know, yeah, we're changed and we've accepted the Lord and it's, all, it's a new me and, it, uh huh, yeah, okay. We'll, we'll see you next barbecue, you know? And it's a year down the road and it's two years and. Man, as the years go by and they see that faith in you do nothing but grow stronger and stronger and stronger, they begin to say, wow, truly, this is the Son of God. Truly, this is a real God. Truly, they have a strong faith. And I think more often than not, they want to they wanna get out there with you. They want a, a piece of what you have, of what God has given to you. John 14, 1 says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God believe also in me. Don't be like the world. Don't just believe that there is a God. Don't just believe that there's a higher power, that there's a creator, that there is something out there. Don't believe the lies of Gnosticism and all these bogus, you know, things that the enemy has, you know, created. Believe in God and believe in Jesus. Believe that he can do great things. Believe that he desires to come down and dwell within us and lead us and guide us. Philippians 4.13 says what? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just uh, thank you, Lord, for this scripture, this portion here, Lord, as we look out at Peter, God, and we can just imagine and just visualize Peter there in the boat, Lord, there in the midst of the storm, God, I know that I would probably look around and think, is this it? Is this my last boat ride? Probably starting to confess every, you know, little sin, everything that, that they've done recently, maybe even to one another. But God, you had something still in store for them. You were not finished with Peter, Lord. You weren't finished with the disciples, God. And Father, I just lift up this congregation to you, Lord. I lift up those that are in this room right now, Father. And I know at times it feels like, it may be the end. It feels like this might be our last boat ride. This is our last chance. This is it. If this doesn't work out, then, you know, I don't know what will. Nothing will. We know, Father, that your word promises that, Lord, your thoughts for us are good thoughts, God. That you have that future, that future of, of hope, that peace for us, as Jeremiah tells us, God. And Lord, we know, God, that you are not finished with us. And a lot of times that it's within these trials and within these hard times that all you are doing, God, is you're building character. That perseverance, Father, that Romans chapter 5 talks about, that perseverance that creates character, that creates hope. As the next verse says, that hope does not disappoint. Lord, you never disappoint, Father. 
And if you're dealing with something right now in your life, I just want to encourage you to just stand up. We just want to pray for you. If something's going on within the family or within the job and you feel like, man, this storm is too great, it's too mighty, I don't know if I can handle this anymore. I don't know if I can deal with this. My faith is beginning to fade. I'm just kind of, I'm here, but I'm not really here. I want you to just stand real quick. There's no shame. All you're doing is putting your faith in Jesus. You're saying, Lord, save me. Lord, do the work. Kaluo, Lord God. Order me to get out of this boat, Lord. Order me to step out from where I am. Father God, you know the hearts of of those that are standing right now, Lord, and you know what they're dealing with. God, you know that for some of them, it's things that they've been dealing with for a long time. They've tried and they've tried and they've tried unsuccessfully. But God, we thank you, Father, that we know that you are the answer, Lord, that you are the hope, Lord God, that your hand is always extended no matter how many steps away from you we get, Lord, you are always just one step back. And we lift them up to you right now, Father, and we pray, God, for purpose. We pray for success even within their lives. We pray, God, that as you had the power in the Sea of Galilee to calm the storm, to calm the waves and the wind, we pray, God, that the issues and the problems and the trials within their lives, God, that they would be calm, Father, that they would diminish, Lord God, even today, Lord, and that they would sit back and that they would be able to say, truly, this is the Son of God. Truly, you are real, Lord. Truly, you are powerful. Truly, you have all the answers. God, we just thank you, Father, that you are a God that loves us and that And again, Father God, that you desire just amazing things for us, Lord, things that we can't even imagine, God. I pray, Father, that you would continue to work within this church, within this body, Lord, that you would build relationships, God, that are strong, that are deep, that are able to encourage one another, Lord. We thank you for this morning, God, and your truths. We pray all this in your name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Let's stand.
bless you guys.